This video deals with sensitive topics. If you have a mental illness, know someone who is mentally ill, or otherwise of a nervous disposition, viewer discretion is advised. I would also like to preface I am not a psychologist nor a professional within this field. I am merely analysing and reflecting upon my experience with the game Hellblade and hoping to spread awareness of psychosis and the pain it inflicts. We all experience some form of delusion or fear, but those with psychosis can experience terrors that others cannot even comprehend, a darkness that engulfs them like no other. They may find themselves separated from reality and hallucinate both audibly and visually. Intrusive thoughts may disturb their mental well-being, causing them to doubt their every thought. Even someone offering to make them a simple cup of tea can turn into a mental conflict as to determining what drives this person to make them a cup of tea in the first place, which could lead to paranoid delusions. They may be paranoid that someone wants to hurt them, or they may believe themselves to have a grandiose position of power, be a divine being or something else entirely. Regardless, to a person with psychosis these delusions can seem very real and are very hard to shake. Of course, not every person with psychosis is the same. Some don't hear voices, some understand that their delusions aren't real, and some may not have as many disturbed thoughts as another. Whatever the case, for each person, psychosis can be a very frightening experience, and Hellblade is trying to capture that experience to teach others about this condition, and also help those that do have psychosis. Through the character of Senua, a young Celtic woman with psychosis, you journey throughout Viking territory as a Celt, warped and perverted into a dark land by her own mind. She seeks to save the soul of her beloved Dillian, while she combats her darkness. This darkness being how she and those around her perceived sinuous psychosis, implying that not only her illness is a form of corruption to be purged, but a senua is also a cloak over her own mind, preventing her from seeing the truth. Instead, in darkness, all she could see are faded silhouettes of what might be true. Much of the trials she combats throughout her journey are conjured up by her mind, and by conquering these trials, Senua believes she can free herself from the darkness. Psychosis takes many forms. In Senua's case, it takes the form of visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as delusions. Immediately as you step foot into the game, the voices in Senua's mind start talking, and with the binaural audio, it really captures how it feels to be a victim of such an illness, as they echo from ear to ear, swapping randomly and whispering abuse, praise and fear alike. They are in constant conflict with one another. It's understandable how these thoughts can make one feel trapped, confused and terrified. These voices are a constant throughout the game and it's a rarity when they cease to be. Because of this it becomes almost unnerving when they are not with you. You feel alone, despite the negativity they inflict upon you. From this it almost creates a sense of reliance on the voices for one's own well-being, even when they are abusive. Throughout Sanua's journey, her mind creates puzzles that cause her to struggle through her quest. She has to find runes in obscure places add the correct perspective to align broken realities to progress. This phenomena is called apophenia, and is described as seeing patterns in objects and associating them with preconceived ideas that one already holds. There is also a more specific variant of apophenia, which occurs when one connects a pattern in an object, say a face, with something they recognise, which is called pareidolia. Whilst pareidolia is not necessarily connected with mental health and is something many of us experience, especially as children, when combined together for a person with psychosis, it can enhance their delusions. For example, if someone with psychosis saw a face in the clouds, they may start believing that they have been blessed by God. For Senua, the tales told by one of her voices, Druth, about the Northmen, their lands and their runes have become fixated in her mind, and now she sees them everywhere, in everything.
During the first combat encounter, Senua's voices both congratulate her and diminish her efforts. When she takes out a foe, they praise her, and when she takes a hit, they may state that she's going to fail and die. Additionally, when she cannot see an enemy from behind whom is about to strike, one of the voices will call out for Senua to evade. As Leonardo de Sicci, a YouTuber who has also made a video on this topic, points out, this can be a very troubling development, as it can lead to a sense of reliance on the voices, and a person with psychosis should not be trusting these voices, as most likely it can lead to a path of self-destruction. As for the enemies themselves, they are of course not real, and are manifestations made by Senua's deluded mind. They could be interpreted as the most harmful and intrusive thought she has, impeding her sense of self-worth on her journey. And as Senua continues and delves ever deeper into her darkness, the intrusive thoughts become increasingly more prominent and dangerous. When you reach the gate to Helheim, you are introduced to the Rot mechanic. The Rot is a manifestation of her darkness, a manifestation that weakens her after every defeat. Every time Senua dies, the rot progresses until it reaches her head, at which point she is lost forever, symbolizing how her confidence and willpower to carry on with her quest against the darkness declines as she continues to lose her battles within her mind. To proceed into Helheim, Senua must first fight two battles of the mind against the god of illusion, Lord Raven, and the fire giant, Surta each symbolizing different types of anguish that Senua has suffered from her psychosis. The hardest battles are fought in the mind, and these will be some of her most brutal yet. As for the Varavan itself, this god of illusion is not present in Norse mythology, but actually stems from Danish folklore. There are two definitions I was able, I was able to find. The first, stated that a Valraven was created when a Thraven feasted upon a king or chieftain's unburied body after being killed in battle. The second, referred to Valravens as being peaceless souls, searching for redemption. In Hellblade, it would seem the most likely interpretation is that Valraven is meant to represent the consistent self-degradation that Senua's depressive psychosis inflicts upon her whenever she loses a mental battle. It gnaws away at her, striking when she feels at her worst. When Senua went out into the, into the wilds with the aim to defeat her darkness, she believed that she fought off this Valraven for good, but it's only on this journey can she finally end this side of her darkness and defeat Valraven once and for all. Unique to this area are what I call the gateway shifts. By moving between gateways adorned with Valraven's feathers, what Senua previously perceived to be blocking her way or impeding her quest, no longer does so. In reality, I believe that those impediments were not actually there, but because of Senua's psychosis acting against her believing that she can't do it, her mind creates a reality wherein the path no longer exists, and to a person with psychosis those delusions can be very, very real. Therefore, as Senua passes through these gates, she alters her mind's perceptions in a manner that she can progress and dispel the delusions. Senua recognizes that the impediments are delusions and she develops an alternative way to overcome them through the gateways, which replaces said delusion with another delusion, but one that just so happens to be much closer to reality. Not only is this a great way to design puzzles for a game, but also an important message for those of psychosis in potentially helping to manage their delusions. If you can recognize what may not be true, you can seek an alternate truth, which is more rational than truth behind it, and thus make a greater sense of the world. Before fighting the Valraven, she is ambushed by it, symbolizing how her psychosis can strike out of nowhere and begin to gnaw away the fiber of her being until there is nothing good remaining only sadness, fear and hate. However, she is told by one of the voices truth that by looking into the iron-clad mirror, Senua will see the face of the darkness that she fear 
and if you focus like I have taught you to, you will also see that as much to the darkness as you trapped within its veil, it too is trapped within yours. With this quote, I focus into the mirror, Senua can realise that despite how often the darkness controls her and what decisions she makes, she can still control them, she can still be the one making those decisions. I understand this is one of the greatest mental battles for someone with psychosis to win, but it is possible and I think that was an incredibly important message for Hellblade to imply. During the actual fight, Valoravan is swift, lithe, and his attacks are unrelenting. His slashing away at Senua could be representative of how her psyche is chipped away at over time by the world around her, by her darkness. Valoravan will also summon other enemies that need, need to be focused upon for Senua to deal damage, and the same to apply to Valoravan once the wave has been dealt with. By focusing on her enemies, her intrusive thoughts, Senua has acknowledged what the problem she is facing is, and how to strike it down. Her willpower can prevail, and it does. Senua wins one of the greatest mental battles she has ever fought. But not this time! Galena, Senua's mother, was the only other person outside of Zillion that seemed to care about Senua. However, Galena too suffered from psychosis, from a darkness, and she died while Senua was still a child. Now, Senua's experiences are paradoidia, and that of her mother guiding her and bringing her comfort. Galena and later Dillian would teach Senua that she is also gifted, and that she can see the world differently to everyone else. She can see and experience the vibrant wonders of the world more so than anyone else. If Senua embraces this side of her illness, she may be able to downplay some of her darkness. This idea of seeing things differently is also made note of in the Hellblade feature. For as long as we have been on this planet, but why? Why has an evolution stamped out this weakness from within our gene pool? I often pondered this question until I realised that the question had an inbuilt flaw. It assumes that being and thinking differently is a weakness. The only reason we have computers, spacecraft, medicine, poetry, art and, yes, even video games is because individuals are able to simulate new abstract realities in their minds and share them with the rest of us. We need people to be willing to see differently in order for us to progress and survive as society. And we need to be open to these new ways of seeing. And it is this spirit that motivated me to create Senna's story and share it with you. Serta, the fire giant, is representative of what happened to her village while she was exiled in the woods, fighting her darkness. In the night, amidst a tempest of water and lightning, Vikings raided her village, raising it to the ground, slaughtering all, including her beloved Dillian, whom was sacrificed in a blood eagle ritual. Because Senua was not present, it is possible that she is suffering from a form of survivor's guilt. This idea is exemplified when you consider the fact that, upon closer inspection, the flashbacks invoked by the pyres have a frame of Senua's burnt mother. It is possible that she also blames herself for what happened to her mother. Therefore, to progress to serve to himself, Senua must relight the sacrificial altars and experience that trauma once more to allow her to charge through the wooden gates. Truth guides her through this trial as he states, Hell will not give you the answers you want, but you mustn't look away from the horrors it does offer, because you cannot overcome suffering if you refuse to look at it. By recreating the reality wherein she too suffers and died, alongside all the other villagers, 
Senua believes she can be reborn as truth states, but this time with the understanding that she was not to blame for what happened. It was a destructive external force outside of her control, and by defeating Serta, Senua puts down the guilty conscience that has been ravaging her mind ever since that day. The fight against Serta himself too represents the sheer weight of the guilt that she faced. Serta is large and imposing, and his heavy hitting attacks blazing down on you can all be representative of the hard truths that Senua must endure to overcome the suffering and guilt she feels for not helping those that suffered at the hands of the Vikings. By defeating Serta, Senua realises the truth that what happened at the raid was not her fault. She accepts that her decision to become a Gelt, an exile living in the woods to fight her sickness, was a decision that she had to make and dying with Dillian and everyone else would accomplish nothing. But as a survivor, Senua still lives to fight on and beat the terror of both her mind and the world. Now that both Guardians of the Gate have been defeated, the path to Helheim is open. Upon entering the gate, Senua has another vision, a vision that haunts her throughout her entire journey. The fate of Dillian and what set her on the path to Hell. In this vision, her psychosis manifests the dreadful voice of her father, Zimbal, to haunt her. It states, Think that I would let you go, that you lost me back in the wilds. I will never let you go. You can't get rid of me. I am your shadow. And I will be watching when you draw your last dying gasp. For victims of psychosis, they are never truly free of it. Whilst they can certainly loosen its grasp over them, its hand will always be on their shoulder and always until that fateful day, which is why Senua and many others in the real world feel a sense of hopelessness when concerning their illness. When you understand that you will never be free of something that wants to control or hurt you, it can be easy to seek drastic measures to free oneself from it. According to the World Health Organization, the mortality rate due to suicide is estimated to be over 12 times greater among people with schizophrenia compared to the general population, and a review published in Medicina titled Suicide and Schizophrenia, an Educational Overview by Leo Scheer and Rene S. Kahn highlights how the lifetime suicide rate in individuals with schizophrenia is approximately 10%. It's because of this that awareness of psychosis needs to be raised and discussions made much more apparent if we are to prevent tragedies such as these. When someone suffers from delusions and hallucinations, the things that are seen, the things that are believed, can be extremely unrealistic and delusional to the point where many will consider it only possible in a dream. However, because of the way that psychotic minds can twist reality, what they see and perceive to be real becomes what many others would only believe in a dream. For example, if you were to have a nightmare when you thought someone was watching you or was chasing you, for a person with, psych with a psychotic mind, they could believe this was happening to them whilst they were in the waking world, even if there was no reason for them to believe this. They could see someone chasing them even though there was no one there. Many advise to those trying to aid loved ones who suffer from delusions and hallucinations not to tell them that these aren't real. This can be very distressing and make it sound as if you're calling them a liar. Instead, from my research, medical abort advise that you just roll with it, redirect it, or simply find out a way which would make the sufferer more comfortable. When Senua confronts Hela for the first time, she collapses, surrendering control over to the source of her darkness, when the dominant voice of her father echoes in the mind, commanding her to fight. She eventually does do so, but is easily defeated and swept aside, tossed into the sea. When she awakens and we see her on the beach, Zimbal's voice has entered the foreground of her mind, 
She's speaking his words, humiliating herself and depriving herself of all sense of worth. She's on the verge of ending her own life. If it weren't for the lingering thought of Dillian, she most likely would have done so. Once again, the thought of loved ones brings Senua back into the light from the darkness that her father drowned her in. As Senua pushes forward, she continues to see the light of Dillian as she relives the memories of her time as a teenager, watching him practice his sword play. The colours are saturated and dreamlike, the world around her is a beauty like no other she has ever seen. Emphasising how Senua can also perceive the wonders of the world, more so than most. Before first meeting Dillian, all Senua had ever experienced was abuse and darkness. But when she talks with him, she experiences an affection she has not felt in years. She feels a ray of hope. We can gather two things from their interaction together. One, that interacting with friendly and familiar faces can be of immense help to treating those that suffer with mental illness. And two, Senua's symptoms are not the cause or the severity of her illness. It's the stigma, symbol, the loss of her mother and the Viking raid that had shaken her mind to its very core. In the tree that resembles the same tree that Senua met Dillian in the Senua finds what she believes to be the sword, Grama, the sword that can slay gods. Both the Northmen and Zimbel consider themselves instruments of the gods, and Zimbel consistently references that Senua disappoints them. Therefore, if she can slay the powers behind her trauma, she destroys any power she believes they have over her, and she can move forwards in life, in her own way. It was important to note that Grandma is meant to be Dillian's sword, and Senua believes that with him she can emerge from her darkness. But first, to free the sword, Senua believes that she must prove her worth in a series of trials. One of the trials that Senua must complete entails travelling between a light and a dark world to reach Dillian's light. This may be representing how Dillian allowed her to see both ways, both light and dark. There are always multiple perspectives in the world, and it is important to see through them to understand the world around you, hence why Senua has to gaze into faces to see through new eyes. Upon reaching Dillian though, his light fades and descends into the watery void below. To Senua, this may be a part of her mind trying to accept that he's gone. No matter what perspective she views the world in, and by accepting a truth present in both worlds, she passes the Tower Shard trial. Next, the Swamp Trial. Swamps are synonymous with corruption, plague, and death. And Senua immersing herself waist deep within the swampy waters could be symbolic of how she and others once perceived Senua to be responsible for the plague that swept through her home in Orkney. When the villagers came for Senua, believing her darkness has cursed them, Senua perceives them as a fiery monster coming to kill her. Whether they truly were out to do so or simply to talk to her, they were a scared and superstitious people, and many people can become aggressive when faced with something they don't understand. So it's Dillian whom helps comfort her. Senua starts questioning as to whether her curse truly has affected the people of her village. But Dillian responds in kind by pointing out how those believing Senua is cursed are themselves deluded. Senua is not to blame for anything, and people just need to stop attacking things they don't understand, including mental illness. So, we can infer two messages here. One for those with psychosis, and one for those without. Concerning the former, there will always be someone to look out for you even when no one else will. And as for the latter, don't lata lash out at others for something you don't understand. It's okay to be scared, but not at the expense of others. In the next trial, Senua is brought to a burial ground. Whilst in reality, we would have buried our dead there. For Senua, 
she may be burying her darkness. However, as one of the voices points out, if you bury something, that doesn't solve the problem. Much like a burst pipe, the problem is released more powerful than ever, hurting those around us. When Senua goes within the burial ground, she is faced with a labyrinth which she must navigate to complete the trial. This maze could be representative of how Senua must navigate her mind to make decisions. In this case, as we find out at the end of the trial, the, the decision to leave home and fight the darkness in the wilds as a guilt, even though this would mean a harsh confrontation with her father. Regardless of what he says, by reaching a conclusion through her mind maze, she stands up to her father, is stalwart in her choices, and leaves her home. escape the darkness. Your curse will make everyone suffer. You will have blood on your hands! Finally, the most frustrating and creepy of all the trials. It entails Senua being lost in her own mind with naught but Dillian's voice to guide her. She is completely bi blind and has nothing but her senses. It's not long before strange creatures are encountered, lingering in the darkness. These creatures too may be symbolic for the intrusive thoughts that do so permeate the minds of those with psychosis. By avoiding them and he heading towards Dillian, Senua is brought back to a reality and her mind becomes happier. However, what's really important to note at the end of the trial is that Dillian was not the one that brought Senua out of the darkness. He was merely a guide. It was Senua who managed to escape. Others can help her, but only she can solve the problems she faces. And that is what helped her pass the trial. Someone was there to help, but I heard your voice. You brought me back. You found your own way back. All you needed was a little help. A little hope. Now, having completed all the trials, Senua can see the world from multiple perspectives, make hard decisions, reach out to others for help, and lastly free herself from the confinements of her own mind. By achieving this, Senua believes that she is worthy of the sword Grammar, and slaying her dark gods once and for all. Once Senua retrieves Grammar, she is sent to a sea of corpses. To the Norse, the Sea of Corpses, or Nalstrand, is a place where murderers, adulterers, and oathbreakers go upon death. All the corpses she sees are those that died in the plague, and because of Zimbel, she believes all of the dead she sees are suffering because of her and her darkness. Hence why Senua believes she is a murderer and belongs in Nalstrand. Nevertheless, as Senua is fighting with Grammar throughout the Twisted Land, She's fighting against her own guilt, to the point where she can free herself of it. It should also be noted that the most prominent of Senua's voices is that of Zimbel, indicating that he is strongest in this section of her mind, and this is for a good reason which we will get to later in the video. Once she frees herself from the Sea of Corpses, we are shown how, during the plague, Senua's guilt reached the point where she was about to follow in the, in the footsteps of her mother and end her life to escape her darkness, but Dillian stops her by giving her the truth that Zimbel is a hateful liar, and she can trust people like Dillian, that there is a future for her with him. Thus, Senua is brought back from the precipice with this hopeful memory, and fights on. Come back to me. Don't let this darkness come between us. In some of the last steps of her journey, Senua delves into the depths of a mountain, travelling towards its roots, and thus the roots of her darkness. Within, the voice of Zimbal permeates Senua's mind. Senua believes that something lurks in the shadows. 
Whenever she sets foot within the darkness, a sense of overwhelming terror overcomes her. She must dash into the light to put her fears to rest. Only the light of a torch allows her to dwell in the darkness. As Senua traverses the darkness, one of the voices in Senua's mind makes note that the darkness of this place is reminiscent of her childhood, wherein her father would leave her in a dark hole to rot, imprison her within her room. Her father did this to ensure her curse would not spread to other people in the village. From this, we can ascertain that Senua's hell is meant to be a resemblance of her childhood trauma at the hands of her father. The darkness in the rooms, the isolation of being stuck in a hole, the beast being the monster in the dark that children speak of, and the light being the few moments that Senua could glimpse of Dillian. Once the path has been cleared, the thing in the shadows is revealed. A great beast comes barreling towards Senua, and she must sprint into the light before it catches her. This beast is Fenrir, the great wolf of Norse myth, sibling to Hel. Within its mythology, Fenrir is the devourer of the sun, and the beast which ripped off the hand of Tyr, the god of war. The gods knew about the prophecy foretelling how Fenrir would wreak havoc upon the Nine Worlds, and thus they sought to bind him to prevent this from happening. In Hellblade, Fenrir may be a representation of the abuse that Zimbel forced upon Senua as a child, and Fenrir's breath, the lies that Zimbel spewed from his mouth, causing Senua's darkest memories to return, and his strikes from the shadows, the sudden outbursts of violence that Zimbel would inflict upon her. By defeating Fenrir, much like the Norse gods of old, Senua binds the darkness of her past so she can control it and look forward to the future. Senua has pierced through the mountain of Zimbel's lies. Now, the voice of Zimbel will cease, at least until she confronts Hel herself. Before the final confrontation with Hela, Senua realises that the true source of her torment, the stigma behind her psychosis, was the trauma that her father inflicted upon her after Galena was executed by his hand, and the following lies spewed from his foul lips. Hela is the manifestation of that trauma, in the form of the half-burned corpse of Senua's mother. However, there's also another interpretation. Senua may perceive Hela as being the part of herself which is telling her to sacrifice Dillian and move on, leaving him as a happy memory. But to Senua, as of now, this is unthinkable, so she is determined to defeat this side. In the fight against Hela herself, I would once again like to refer to Leonardo da Sicci. As a person with psychosis himself, he makes important note of how symbolically fighting wave after wave, mental battle after mental battle, turns to physical exhaustion, and as a video game, Hellblade is perfect for encapsulating that. As a player, fighting these waves of enemies becomes tiring, tiring to the point where you can go no further but accept defeat. No other medium can capture this sense to the same extent as video games. Eventually, Senua admits defeat to Hela, and Hela stabs her with grammar. And as this side of her mentality dies, she hears Dillian. After hearing he w his words, she realises that the only way to finally overcome her trauma and move on is to look it in the eye, embrace it, and understand her darkness. She must realise that the final lie was the one she has been telling herself, the lie that Dillian can be saved. Senua momentarily embraces the side of her that is Hela and sacrifices Dillian. She lets go of the last memento she has of him and walks away. Senua has made her sacrifice and emerged from her darkness, but not without hardship, not without suffering, but she has emerged. She can accept who she is and that the darkness is a part of her and that she can control it. This ending message is incredibly important for those that suffer with a mental illness such as psychosis. Even though it may seem like there's no escape, no hope, you can pull through, but acceptance and understanding is key. 
Without that, a perilous path awaits. This is where my story once began. And so it has to end here. Because I cannot see further than this. Follow us. We have another story to tell. My friend. this video please leave a like subscribe if you didn't please let me know why leave a comment whatever the case i hope to see you in the next one see ya